Where did you have interest? Whereabouts have you got to in the book? Um, I'm on uh, page. I'm only on page fifty-eight actually of mine, which is the middle of chapter four. Oh, okay. So you're not too far in. I'm not too far in. Um, How much about chapter one can you remember? Uh, quite a bit. I I leafed through it uh, just a little while ago. Yeah, see, I thought about doing that and thought, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go off memory. Admittedly, I am rereading the damn thing. And welcome, one and all. Welcome to something just a little bit different. So, this is going to be the first episode of the book club. Yeah, this could go terribly long. This could go terribly right. We will see. So, I'm Tremors Prime, and I'm joined by... Zerfall. Hi, everyone. Hello, mate. And we are going to be talking about Neuromancer, a book that was released in 1984 and was written by William Gibson. So, have you actually read the book before, mate? Um, I've actually not read the book. Um, and my brother was in town when I mentioned the book club thing. And he was, he's, uh, he's so into this, but he says it's one of his favorite books of all time. Okay. So, so he uh, he immediately made us drive to the bookstore, and he's like, you're doing this book club thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, fantastic. Um, so, I mean, before, I mean, obviously you've, you've told me you've read a few chapters. Yes. How much about the book did you actually know before you dove into it? Um, I've seen clips from Johnny Mnemonic. Oh, God in hell. <laughs> uh, okay, so people that and... don't know, Johnny Mnemonic is a film based on a short story that prequels Neuromancer, and it contains one of the characters that later appears in Neuromancer, the character of Molly. Um, start Keanu Reeves and Kintano Takeshi? I think that's right, isn't it? No, that's uh, not right. I'm thinking of Takeshi's Castle. And I'm thinking of Battle Royale. Who the fuck did it star? The, can you remember the Japanese guy who was the assassin? I can't remember. Like, I've literally, it was just on the Sci Fi Channel one time, and I oh, saw it in between. Lord. And whenever it went to a commercial, I'd be like, you know what? I'll go to find something else. But it was a Saturday, and nothing else was on. Right. I will probably put some sort of thing across the screen telling people who the fuck I'm on about. And yes, I will <laughs> swear because I'm British, and that's what I do. Um. Okay. So anyway, 1984. Cyberpunk is a developing genre at that point. So this book is quite groundbreaking, the fact that a lot of the themes, the language, the setting, it's very much what cyberpunk has taken from and grown out of, as it were. So reading, we're going to talk a bit about the first chapter, and it doesn't really give anything away, but it, it sort of does talk about our main character and the setting. So actually, before we talk about the main character, the setting, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I think that uh, he paints a pretty good picture of the world. Uh, in the first chapter, he goes through a lot of things. The first line, even, the sky above the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. Now, to people like you and me, they're a little bit can remember maybe CRT yeah. televisions, right? It's yeah. not necessarily the static from a dead channel. It's more of like the, you know, when a CRT is on, but there's nothing showing and it's not black. Yeah. The, the, oh, the see, black I, that glows. I thought he was going for more of the sort of, you know, like the, um, the gray snow. Yeah, well, I, that's what I kind of thought, um, too, when uh, my brother was telling me about it. Yeah. He told me to think back to the CRT televisions, right? And if they weren't, if they didn't have a cable plugged into them and they just were black with none, no, of, the, yeah. none of the static, it was like that. It's like, you know, the starry night, there's no stars. You can't see the stars for the glow of the city. Yeah, no, I actually completely agree with you that, that now, because I always sort of, Neuromancer, you never really imagine when you're reading it to be in the day. Mm -hmm. that's that sounds it always sort of appears to be at night and that's another sort of cyberpunk trope that's come out of the book yeah when you were reading it did it feel very 80s to you um and when i, I say yeah do you know what especially when they describe technology yeah right he uses he uses things that sound almost futuristic if you are reading it in the 80s but if you're reading it now, you're like, what? What is this? Like 1991? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, when I the thing I liked about it is there's lots of neon. It all comes across as you know, like in uh, 80s films, where it's like the seediness, the, like there's hookers on the street. There's <laughs> it's all it feels like that. And then there's the arcades. Yeah. Now, I mean, arcades being what they were, are obviously died a horrible death. But yeah. he still imagines the arcades all being there, and there's kids pranging around in them, and it's. It's, it's especially when you think about the eighties and you think, okay, technology was going along really fast, and he's imagining a world that, yeah, sure, it's techno technologically sort of going forward, but it still feels very close to yeah, what he's experienced. Society kind of stayed in the same place, even if it got a little bit more seedy. 
Yeah, exactly. And I feel we've actually maybe jumped forward a bit, so I might have to actually do a bit of creative editing here. Maybe I won't. <laughs> Cyberpunk. What are your sort of experiences with it? Well, I would say my first experience with Cyberpunk was probably um, Shadowrun, Shadowrunner for the uh, Super Nintendo. Right, okay. And, uh, and I mean, the main character is named after one of the characters in Neuromancer, right? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think it's a homage, as it yes, were. Yes, it's not. It's not supposed to be the same guy or anything. It's just no. But if you, unfortunately, if you've played any of the Neuromancer games and then you go to read Neuromancer, as soon as you read that name, you'll be like, "Damn it!" and you'll just see the bloke's <laughs> face. Well, um, it's funny too because the character in uh, the character in Shadowrunner for um, Super Nintendo is a lot more like Case than he is like uh, Armitage or Armitage. Armitage, or yeah. Um, Shadowrun was a weird. Actually, I mean, fuck it. We'll talk about Shadowrun for a second, actually. There are a couple of things mentioned in Shadowrun. For example, the sprawl, which is what Gibson like refers to as this, this the sprawl of people, the city. That appears in Shadowrun. The fact that you've got Armitage, the fact that in the game, I believe, Molly makes a cameo in the SNES version. Not and I know might. we keep mentioning Molly and really... I can't really talk about it much. This is going to be the worst book club ever known, where we give away <laughs> the entire plot in a small video, and that can wait for the second part. So, yeah, Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk is basically a technologically forward but dystopian future. Technology mm. has never really advanced in the way that everyone's thought it has, and as I've said, it's very much sort of glued into the 80s. You can imagine someone... Sort of hacking into um into cyberspace, but they're doing it on some sort of wood panelled computer. You know what I mean? They're using like an yeah. Atari twenty six hundred to basically rip off corporations, and that's an interesting note as well. The word cyberspace is actually coined by William Gibson. Hmm. He invented the term, and it is now in the modern lexicon. Yeah, which is you know completely bonkers when you actually think about it. Yeah, it's not it's not often you can point to uh, the person that that brought up the slang for internet. No, exactly. Or something like that. And it's all down to a bloody uh, cyberpunk book, which is the weirdest thing of all. So, let's talk about the story. This thing's cyberpunk. It was written in the 80s, and it basically is the book that created most of the cyberpunk tropes. Yeah. So, our main character. What are your thoughts on him? Well, especially in the first chapter, he's very much a man who's at the lowest point in his life. He's had the the one thing he loved the most, which was cyberspace, taken mm-hmm. away from him, and uh, he's just trying to he's trying to burn out as fast as he can, sort of thing. And I've actually just forgotten his name. Uh, Case, that was it. So yeah, this guy is basically completely burnt out. He he's paranoid. He's delusional. He hasn't got much money left. And he, to be honest, he thinks everyone's out to get him. And in some ways, they are. And in some ways, he kind of wants them to be. Oh, exactly. I mean, this guy, I can't quite remember what he did now, but he was basically the top of his game. He was going for it. He was basically doing jobs, taking money from corporations, breaking the law. And then something went horribly wrong. He tried to steal from one of his employers. Oh, was that the thing? Yeah. Now, you have to sort of help me out a bit here, because obviously I've only read it very recently and I've forgotten most of it. (laughs) (laughs) As you would when you're trying to do a thing for fucking YouTube. But... Now, is it his implants that get damaged, or is it something um, it's, in his it's brain? It's actually his his neural pathways get uh, get fried. Ah, see, that was the one. They give him a neurotoxin or something like that, and it uh, it was enough just to keep him from being able to get into cyberspace, but leave him pretty lucid every other way. Yeah. So this guy goes from the top of this game to being basically nothing, and it's sort of like um, a, a bird getting its wings clipped. He's stranded. Mm. He, he, to be honest, he doesn't have that many friends. And I say, he owes money to a lot of dangerous people, so much so that in the first chapter, he is convinced that someone's out to kill him and buys various weapons. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what was the first one? The first one, I think, was it a cobra or something like that? It was a, some sort of snake thing. Did he buy um, a cobra? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe like, he did. Like it, was, it was named, I think it was named a cobra. It was like, I think it's supposed to be some sort of, like electrified whip maybe or something because because the guy didn't have a gun anyone that reads that now just imagine he buys some sort of spitting cobra and blames <laughs> earth out for that 
just when you read that scene, just go, no, no, it's Spit and Cobra. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah. I, do you know what? The one thing was is he didn't describe that first weapon very well. No. I was, uh, I was confused as to what it was, and then when he gets rid of it without ever using it, I really, I was like, I don't know. Yeah, he is a bit of a numpty. He spends all this, he's, basically he spends nearly the rest of his money that he's got on this nightstick cobra type thing. And it is called a cobra. I've got, I just flipped the book open. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a three oiled telescoping it has three oiled telescoping segments of tightly wound coil spring. Well there we go. And when Just he presses a, man- a button they come out. I don't know how it's a weapon, but it, it looks is. like a cobra. Um <laughs> I mean the thing is he throws this weapon in a dumpster as soon as he gets a chance to get a gun. You know, you've spent pretty much the last of your money on this mate, and now you've done that. <laughs> Although if you think about it, it's very much like every video game you ever play. You spend all your money at the beginning of the game on the best weapon you can get, and as soon as you get to the next town, you throw it in the garbage and grab a new one. Yeah, but he's got two hands. That's it's true. A, it's a pistol <laughs> and a... Oh, and he has to give the pistol back too, so I don't know. Exactly, so it's pretty much pointless in the end of the day. Um, so how do you think we have done? How have we managed to sum up that first chapter vaguely? Pretty much. Uh, the only thing we haven't really touched on is his big chase scene. Ah, with the woman who is not really identified, but we have technically identified. Yes. Now, what's interesting about the person that follows him is she has these glasses, and they're sort of surgically attached, so you actually never see her eyes. They're perfectly done round her eye sockets, and you can imagine this guy's paranoid, he's, he's basically terrified for his life, and he's being chased by this woman. I mean, I think there's a great bit where he's chased through the arcade and she kicks the crap out of a security guard or a police officer? Yeah, he uh, he runs up the stairs into the one of the offices and he says for the one girl that's there to call security and then he hides in a room and uh, I think he hears the scuffle and stuff and later on you hear that one of them was uh, was killed or something like that. Now, I'm trying to remember, does she have, like, razors on it? Yeah, she's got finger razors. That's mentioned when she when she finally catches up to him and has him cornered. Uh, she puts away her dart gun and just to show that she's not defenseless, she shoots little razors out of her fingers and... Yeah, actually, I've just got the actual page. Hang on. She held out her hands, palms up, the white fingers slightly spread, and with a barely audible click, ten... Ooh, ten double-edged, four-centimeter scalped blades slid from their housings beneath the burgundy nails. She smiled, the blades slowly withdrew. And that's actually the point where he's basically running, he thinks this assassin's been sent by this guy he owes money to, and she catches up to him. And does it actually say, before I spoil anything? No, yeah, it mentions that uh, she's not there to hurt him at all. She's just collecting him. And that is the end of chapter one. So essentially we have a character who isn't particularly likeable, I don't think. He's in this dystopian world, he's on the, well... He's made a mess of his life, you know, with decisions he's made, decisions that other people have made, and now someone has come to get him. Yeah, if there's any, if there's any positive, I don't know if it's a positive feeling that you can feel towards him, it's pretty much pity. Oh, God, yeah, no, I mean, he's this (laughs) cocky little shitbag in, in, you know, in reality, that's, this is sort of, this is the horrible life he now leads, but at the end of chapter one, you sort of go, well, hang on, who the hell wants him, and if they don't want to hurt him... Is this a chance for things to be put right? Mm. Okay. So that was pretty much the introduction I was going for. It was a bit hit and miss, and I doubt I'll edit it at all. So you'll end up with random (laughs) crap for for a good 20 minutes or however long we end up doing this for. So I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to work this, because obviously I'm hoping maybe mm, some people end up wanting to read this as well. Yeah, I think it would be good if we could get, um, how many parts are there to this book? Um, Because it has chapters, but then it also has parts. Yeah, I mean, I thought, I mean, I've got this 20th anniversary edition, which I picked up a couple of years ago. It's the hardback. So I've got 300, oh, no, that's the afterthought. I think there's only about 12 chapters, you know. Well, it's not a long book. If we if we try to well, uh, we can probably figure this out off camera and put it in the uh, in the comments. But every so many chapters, if we if we meet up for a discussion, it would be good if uh, 
anyone that's reading along at home maybe can uh, can can pop in and post comments on what they think of the things that are going on. Oh yeah, no, exactly. I mean, the thing is, if you have read the book and you would basically like to, again, like you said, fire off some comments and say what you thought about it. And or it's... correct us where we're blatantly wrong. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, especially if you... I mean, at the end of the day, we're both two gamers who are randomly trying to talk about something interesting. But if you want to sort of contribute and want to be on any of the other parts to talk about the book, feel free, because at the end of the day, the more people you've got the better this is going to work out. And obviously, if this experiment works, I'm hoping I can bully Zerfan's coming back for more books. So <laughs> I might even let him pick the next one. Hmm. <laughs> okay, then. So, yeah, in the end of the day, guys, thanks for listening, and hope to see you on the next episode of The Book Club. Bye now. Ta-ta for now. Bye-bye. Oh, and do you know what the worst part of that book is? So Pride and Prejudice is like a dry, crappy book, and then they add yeah. zombies to it, and it didn't it didn't spice it up enough. It's still because they write in the same style, so it's still like, oh, how dare you? Dry? Can you not remember the seat? And all? have you actually read the original? I have. It's all like, oh, Mister Darcy, I fancy you. Oh, I don't fancy you. You're beneath me. Oh, I think I'm beginning to fancy you now. What? I'm beneath you. I don't fancy you anymore. And then they eventually get together. Yeah, there's a great scene, I'm pretty sure, where she's talking about, um, they're looking at a shop, and they're talking about how well hung Darcy's drapes are. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually a pretty good line. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Probably the best line. But it doesn't, but it doesn't in, save uh, the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs>